innermost fears that kept you awake each night. Are you ready now to face the heart of darkness? In 1998, Heart of Darkness was released on the PC and original PlayStation, and it made little impact on the gaming industry, market or culture. That's not unique, plenty of games have little to no effect on the zeitgeist, but this was a game that had real momentum only a few years previous. It was backed by a powerful publisher, headed by exciting and successful developers, and even had rumours of a Steven Spielberg film adaption. For Heart of Darkness just to release like a drop in the ocean seems crazy, yet time didn't make the heart grow fonder, though if you have heard of Heart of Darkness, then you probably know it for one reason, and that reason is it's quite brutal death animations, something quite at odds with its E for everyone age rating. We're going to go through Heart of Darkness, explore these criticisms, examine the story and how it's presented, and judge every puzzle as we overcome them. Not only will we be able to evaluate Heart of Darkness, but I will explain why the death animations are an important part of the game and not just a meme. And just as a teaser, I will show you why they aren't the most adult thing in this children's game. To understand Heart of Darkness, we must first look into its creation. Also, worth stating, this game is not based on the classic novella by Joseph Conrad and has nothing to do with any literary work that I know of. Heart of Darkness's development started back in 1992. That means that the development of this quite small title took six years. Let that sink in. For a game that began its life in the early 90s, six years was kind of unprecedented, even more so from a small developer. As you can imagine, this means that development of this game was anything but smooth sailing. Heart of Darkness was developed by the French Amazing Studio. Not Amazing Studios, Amazing Studio. And spoilers, this was their only game before they changed focus from video games to film post-production. Amazing Studio was co-founded by Eric Chahi, and Frédéric Savoie, I think that's how you pronounce it, I'm not French, and they vied to push the limits of what was possible in gaming. This wasn't just some forlorn hope, but a real objective set by the pair that had already proved their worth. Chahi had been a proficient games developer in the late 80s and early 90s, working for Lorisels and then Delphine Software International. In his time, he worked a variety of games, but this wasn't good enough for our Eric. No, in 1989, after working on the graphics for Delphine's Future Wars, he decided to work on a project all of his own, and what he turned out was just amazing. For two years he toiled, and what he produced was Another World. That, that's a video game called Another World. Or, unless you live in North America, then it was called Out of This World. We could dwell on this title for a long while, and I will be referring back to this cult classic, but the reason I'm bringing this title up is because it really epitomizes the design philosophy that Chahi brought to Heart of Darkness, and why so many people were excited for this project, both from within and from without the industry. Another world as I will be calling it, was originally released on the Atari ST, or ST, and Amiga in November 1991, though was ported extensively soon after. What you can see is a ginger-haired man named Lester travelling to an alien planet and trying to escape the clutches of a tyrannical civilization with the help of his fellow prison escapee. To escape this harsh and inhospitable world, you must explore, fight, and solve puzzles through the medium of classic side-scrolling puzzle platforming. The first thing you'll notice is a real style to the game. It manages to deliver a tremendous atmosphere with really very little. Each scene has been crafted with several well-designed layers to give the illusion of depth and the feeling that this world is really bigger than what you actually can see, while also framing the protagonists behind gloomy caves, vast alien columns, or in the nowhere of the vast deadlands. Yes, the shapes and character design can be rather simple, having basic shapes that create the individual characters and enemies, but as my wife always says, it's not what you have, but what you do with it. And Jahi lovingly crafts these simple shapes into grand set pieces. You can tell there's a strong focus on environmental storytelling and world design here, which really pulls through the game. While the story may be basic, man gets pulled to an alien world and must escape, 
way the story is told is done in a way that harkens to a way a film is shot. Cut scenes, while few, set the scene with the small character details such as Lester drinking his fizzy drink at the beginning, telling a small bit about our man and the way that Lester and his foes move through the scenes also have an air of real trepidation. Chahi is focused on making adventure come alive over everything else and this, another world, is seen by many as a pivotal game that influenced many high profile games such as Metal Gear Solid and Silent Hill for its focus on atmosphere over everything. To put it short, this man knows how to craft the feeling of adventure. But Amazing Studio wasn't just Jahi alone, it was co-founded by Frederick Savoy and he had worked with many of Amazing Studio's employees on the game Flashback, developed by Delphine. This was another 2D puzzle platformer that oozes atmosphere. It certainly took inspiration from another world, but with a bigger team, well, a team that's not just one fella, the graphics were much improved. The background had higher fidelity and the main protagonist was much, much more detailed and even more realistic in his movements. They did use rotoscope animation to get this fluidity, not unlike, but apparently completely independent of Prince of Persia, which had been released just like moments before. And while there is squabbles about the superiority of these two games, I much prefer the set design of Another World for instance, you could tell there's a real understanding of what made the 2D puzzle platformers great. Getting this talent together for a new, much more ambitious project was therefore incredibly exciting and it is no wonder that Amazing Studio got the funding of Virgin Interactive Entertainment. Between 1992 and 1995 there was little information about the goings on at Amazing Studio. While there had been rumours about a promising title that was looking to blow people away, had rumours of Steven Spielberg, no one had actually seen any proof. It wasn't until the best year in the history of everything, 1995, that gaming magazines and the general public was shown glimpses of Heart of Darkness. From its first reveal at the 1995 European Computer Trade Show, a buzz started to arise with outlets praising its beautiful graphics, great soundtrack and its modern 3D cutscenes. What was even more exciting was that the game was apparently near completion and when you look at screenshots that were made available for magazines at the time, this doesn't seem to be the case of people fibbing. It was a surprise then when it was announced that the release of Heart of Darkness wouldn't be until the next year, that being 1996. At this point in time, the game had been announced with several different consoles, primarily being developed for the PC, but there would be ports for several others. This included the Amiga CD32, Atari Jaguar and the 3DO. There was even talk of a Panasonic M2 being in the works, and I didn't even know that was a thing. This kind of excessive porting was not unusual for the time, but it cannot have helped the studio to be pushed and pulled in several directions. Keeping in mind all the different specifications they would have had to work to, it surely would have slowed the development of any game. It was surprising with the aim to port Heart of Darkness to several different consoles that the decision was made in early 1996 to make the game a partial Sega Saturn exclusive, with the game being solely sold for that system with a PC version releasing quite a bit later. This did give Amazing Studio some breathing room to finish the game, with the Sega Saturn not launching until October of that year, and it would hopefully streamline the development to only one home console and the PC. While at first this delighted Sega publications with exciting previews being featured in Sega Saturn magazine, it became clear to all that the October 1996 release date was not possible, and this same magazine that had heaped so much praise called it a joke of a situation. This happened to be the last straw for publisher Virgin Interactive and they dropped all funding for the game in December 1996, leaving the game in limbo. But what had been taking Amazing Studios so long to come up with the goods? Surely they had simplified their output, focusing production to a couple of consoles, and even before then they were apparently nearly finished. Well, game development is never normally that simple, and there is no one reason why the project was extended into 1997, but Frederick Savoir did state in later interviews that the project just wasn't living up to their high expectations. They were constantly tweaking Lots of factors in trying to make the game that little bit better. A quote of his goes as saying, With a realistic game in which the background is a very nice drawing, we felt that people didn't know where to go, didn't know what to do, where to jump, where to run, etc. So we redid these areas maybe 10 times and we've done some testing and tuning with people to make sure they know where they need to go and what they need to do. 
I managed to contact Frederick on the website previously known as Twitter, and he simply just re-emphasized the same point. Ultimately, this left them without a publisher in 1997, and without a publisher, they were unlikely to put games on shelves. Despite this, this game, that had become a bit of a burdensome love child, wasn't given up on, and Amazing Studio managed their final bit of finance to continue development into 1997, demoing the game once more at the European Computer Trade Show, this time in a near complete form. Interplay then adopted the title and chose to publish it on both the PC and the new PlayStation console that was dominating the market. Was it worth it though? At the time of release, the game got middling to favourable reviews that we mentioned earlier with the reviewers praising the presentation of the game, but calling the gameplay a bit bland and overall the game wasn't really worth the wait. There was also a common thread of journalists calling the game outdated. The PlayStation had heralded the beginning of truly 3D gaming experiences, and this game was a 2D puzzle platformer that's gameplay and graphics harken back nearly a decade. However, that criticism itself seems slightly dated now. While 3D was the big thing at the time, it is not the be-all and end-all of game design anymore. Arguably, the most influential game of the last few years is Among Us, and that has a much more simplified look. Going forward, the question that will surround this retrospective boils down to whether or not this game was really released at the wrong time. Did its own development cycle outdate the game by the time it was released, or were there more significant problems with Heart of Darkness? Well, let's find out. Ah, the opening PlayStation crawl. Who doesn't love that? Nostalgia in waveform form. Now, I should admit that the footage that I'm playing is from the Duck Station emulator. This is for a fair few reasons. Firstly, it is so much easier and so much cheaper to record footage this way. My old PlayStation needs a new part and I only have the basic bare capture card for my PS2. Secondly, and this will become more apparent, my copy of Heart of Darkness doesn't load its second disc. I have no idea why, it isn't scratched, but the changing of hardware just stops it. I have played the game through before on its intentional hardware, and I have noticed no difference to the PAL ROM that I have loaded. I also could see no changes from PAL to the NTSC versions, but I didn't thoroughly play through the NTSC version though there are no listed changes anywhere I could find online either. Getting back to the game, after the usual 90s legal disclaimers and several loading screens, we get to quite a boring menu screen. This is a bit of a curveball being thrown at the beginning of your experience of this game, because this game could certainly be argued to have a presentation over performance problem. Look, even the now loading screen has a bit of flavour with the old-fashioned heavy-duty tape recorder bobbing with intent from one imaginary foot to another. To have a menu that has no movement or life feels really odd in retrospect. Oh look, I said the word retrospect. To be fair, the logo is beautiful and the menu could be argued to have a nice minimalist vibe that doesn't overcomplicate itself. It just doesn't have quite the charm and attention to detail the rest of the game has. Yes, this is just the menu screen, but let's just look at the options menu for comparison. Look at that, a full 3D rendering of our hero's treehouse, with all these gadgets and gizmos that are used to represent the variety of options, each of which interacts with our input to some degree. Not only does it kind of make the minimalist menu somewhat obsolete, it also gives us a real look into the vibe this game gives off, and the archetype of our main protagonist. This gives a full-on 80s children adventure story energy, and every detail from the background circuitry to the homemade bias on the PC tells you this kid is an overly ambitious teenage inventor that wants to explore the world both literally and figuratively with his various scientific apparatus. Maybe this could feel a bit cluttered. Yes, the main menu is far more functional, but this alternative menu just oozes with personal and unnecessary touches that can't help but make you engage with the game. Anyway, enough chatter, let's press new game. Lights on and away we go. Even before the first logos appear in the first cinematic, 
we are brought into the game's world by its music. This music is composed by Bruce Broughton, a well-known, if not famous, composer who has a lot of successful work in television, winning 10 Emmys. He was even nominated for an Academy Award with Dennis Spiegel with Alone Yet Not Alone in 2013, though it was later disqualified when Bruce was argued to have overstepped his role as executive committee member of the Academy's music branch, for whatever that means. While he worked on shows such as Dallas, though he didn't do the theme, his most recognisable work was probably his arrangement of the longer 21 second 20th Century Fox opening role that he conducted as well. This has been used as a benchmark for the role ever since. Bruce might not be a household name but he certainly knows his stuff and his opening theme really fits the brief of adventure. As we swirl through the opening credits we are supported by a soft roll of brass followed by strings answering their call leading to a vibration of uncertainty. You don't exactly hear the theme of Heart of Darkness, instead you remember it, as it takes you through a ride of familiar archetypes of adventure theme classics. And there's nothing wrong with this. We are made to think of Indiana Jones, The Goonies, E.T. and other classic family adventure romps. Though there is a stronger feel of longing and a bit of a darker edge that comes to full force when the game's logo, somewhat ironically, bursts into light and fills the screen. The bombastic nature of which has only ever been matched, at least in my eyes, with Final Fantasy VII's opening logo when it appears over the dark and dingy streets of Midgar. Now we zoom through the solar system with this melodramatic darkness in tow. As the game shows some beautiful transition through Saturn's rings, hearing the faint echo of a lecture on the nature of black holes, before falling through the air into a classroom where a ginger boy is sleeping. Sleeping in my class in broad daylight. Well, let's see if you're more alert in the dark. You can spend Mommy. the rest of the hour in the cupboard. You can't shut me up in there. I know my rights. My uncle's a lawyer. And mine's a judge. Oh, that in there. oh wow. <laughs> Afraid of the dark. <laughs> Come back here this minute, young man. No way, Jose. There's an eclipse of the sun today. There'll be a test about it tomorrow. I I need to freeze and process everything that has just happened. That brief classroom scene has a lot of crazy stuffed into a few seconds. Before we even get into that, I have to mention this game's cutscenes really do stutter. And for a person who can't really tell the difference between 30 and 60 FPS, even I can get turned off by this. However, in the frames that we do get, there is a lot of detail for something that was released in 1998 and what is going to be a buzzword for this retrospective, environmental storytelling. Firstly, we get a glimpse of our champion Andy, a gingerhead boy. Chahi must really love gingers, and he is asleep during class. We can tell that Andy is a bit of a wild child that uses such 90s rebellious slang as and has graffiti on his desk and is dressed with a cowboy scarf. But all of this is undercut by a teacher that makes Mrs. Trunchbull from Matilda look like the goddaughter of Mother Teresa and Mahatma Gandhi. Grabbing and forcing a child into a small cramped cupboard is not good safeguarding, and laughing at them being scared of being shut in a tiny box will certainly affect the school's Ofsted rating. We also hear Andy's scream that will become more iconic than the Wilhelm scream by the end of this retrospective. All of this is just bizarre and it tells us something about Andy both his attitudes and his fears. After this weird interaction, he escapes school and gets the joy that only the end of school slash escaping a psychopath can bring. And his day gets even better when he's met by his faithful companion, Whiskey. Whis Whiskey's a dog if you're listening. They run to catch their tram, causing havoc as they go through the city. More classic adventure music devised by Broughton regales us during Andy's escape to freedom. Thank <laughs> you. 
And that freedom finds Andy in the park laying down with his dog by his side. Idyllic. But it doesn't stay idyllic for long. People have started looking up at the eclipse with Andy channeling his inner Donald Trump and looking up without any eye protection. This clearly affects his dog protection skills and as the shadows grow bigger and at the peak of the eclipse, Whiskey is taken away by sinister forces in the sky, with Andy's hat falling slowly from our friend back to the earth. With a tear in his eye, Andy rushes back to find a way to save his friend. Andy! Come in the house! In a minute, Mom, okay? Reaching his home, Andy fires off a toy gun that sets off some Rube Goldberg machine of sorts to get up his treehouse. From there, he sets off using his homemade computer to fire up his even more homemade spaceship while also packing his provisions of a sci-fi gun, apple and camera. With that, Andy sets off above the sky. But again, I have to stop here and mention four things. Firstly, the BIOS of his computer is called the Buddy BIOS, maybe in reference to another world's helpful companion who's called Buddy. Secondly, the frame rate for certain sections is much greater than others, making the scene smoother and lulling your eyes into a full sense of security. Thirdly, why was a kid so obsessed with science and spaceships and all that, sleeping in a curious and imaginative lesson about space? Lastly, and certainly not least, his mum wants to have a word with him about school as his teacher has called. This is very brazen for a teacher to call and complain about a child that he himself has been psychologically abusing. Anyway, back above the clouds. Again, the score is allowed to soar along with Andy and reflects this odd but intriguing adventure we are setting off on. Hang on, Whiskey, I'm coming. What the heck was that? And he heads back down and is now in some sort of alien world of fire and brimstone whose grotesque bone creatures he meets firsthand via the introduction of his windscreen. This causes his spaceship to buckle and crash, coming to stop at the end of a precarious canyon. Okay, okay. And now the game can actually begin. You're a big help, you know that? Heart of Darkness is a 2D puzzle platformer and now we can see that in full effect. We can see Andy's transition from a 3D model to 2D sprite, and I think he looks charming. There's a lot going on in so few pixels. Just standing on his spaceship, you can make out his colander-based space gun, his red scarf, and his weirdly cut blue crop top that he's wearing. All of this is against the greatly detailed backdrop of the canyon we saw before, and depth is given in a classic Chahi style, with several layers of scenery placed both in front and behind of Andy. 
While this is very reminiscent of another world, there is nothing basic about the geometry and there is plenty of additional touches to each asset that really gives this game its charm. And this is consistent for the whole of the game. As we jump off the spaceship, it explodes dramatically and alters the pre-rendered backdrop. Well, there seems to be only one way to go and that's to the right. Unlike some platformers, Andy's sprite has real weight to it. When he runs, he really needs to build up speed. When he jumps, he needs to bend his knees before springing up and this makes him feel more real. The animations add to this realism and while he might be a bunch of pixels, you definitely have that illusion of control over a human being, albeit one with flamboyance to every action. The first monster you encounter appears like a shadow, mainly because it is one and it lurks slowly towards you. I'm going to call these little squally ones lurkers. A quick blast with your gun, pressing circle while crouched, makes it explode with blue energy from inside outward. I must say that I do know the section of this game extremely well, in some sort of nostalgia full muscle memory way. I thought I'd show off how your first unfair death most likely will occur. As you walk through this decayed mountainside, you come across a large skeleton, birthed of some old horrific creature. Again, environmental storytelling. Its shadow is floating on the background. By walking towards this shadow, it comes alive and attacks you, making Andy fall from under his feet into the first of many death animations. This one being unique, or kind of anyway, in that it's 3D rendered and it shows Andy falling to unknown depths below. This is reused later with different animated backgrounds, but most deaths happen in the 2D space. You may scream that this death is unfair and, well, yes it is, but it is trying to teach you some mechanics that are important for the game. You've learned to jump and fire, now you need to be aware of your environment, especially shadows. I would be more annoyed if the game didn't nearly instantly reset you to just before that death. This game is a trial and error puzzle game. You will need to learn each puzzle, likely failing several ways in order to learn the solution. While this could be argued to be bad game design, if things are telegraphed and the game has some internal logic, this trial and error can be fun, as long as everything is set up in the correct way. We will get on to what is the correct way later. What is especially important is that the game is quick to reset and if you're expected to die then at least you are given regular and often checkpoints. Predicting, if not planning you to die here, Heart of Darkness instantly reloads to the same screen and now we know to blast that skeleton away and we can follow up by blasting the skeleton in the next scene. A few sections forward we meet a shadow. This one, unlike the lurker of before, is upright and has an attitude to boot. But by God doesn't his animation give some real sense of what it's about. This fella is a proper cheeky chappy that can suddenly turn and become the devourer of souls. He is plain dark black but it looks like the darkness is just oozing off of him, sticking between his outstretched arms like the cheese of a pizza slice. He manages to grab me and I have to do this struggle mechanic, shifting Andy from side to side with the directional arrows to force him off. This is in the instruction booklet, but I think it's pretty self-explanatory if you haven't read it, though you were expected to read the instruction booklets back in the day. He continues to giggle in some unnerving, unknown language as I fill him full of electric lead. Well, where to now? The path in front of me is blocked and I can't jump over it. Well, that skull jumps out a bit, so let's give it a good shoot. Well, that worked. It falls into the background. I'm blocking our path. However, it also opens a cave where a swarm of them shadows are diving out and heading towards our main man. Running for our life, we reach the next scene and we see the shadow look at us before pointing out to his friends off screen. Oh my god, we're, we're surrounded. Now, let's just stop for a second and admire the characterization of these shadows. The way they act and approach us is Machiavellian and mischievous and silly, yet has a dark and dingy edge to them. You also start to notice different types of shadows. I get a couple, but some are thin and high pitched that move suddenly and fast, and others have a movement like apes that are harsher and have a heavier set to them, yet can still act in that mischievous way. All of them seek darkness off them and they surround Andy. This requires action. Yes, there, there is actual combat in this and while some of it definitely combines with the puzzles, often it's more about how well you shoot. 
Allowing them to come too close can lead to you being gobbled up by the darkness. Literally, they will grab you and brutally eat you. Andy's deaths will start to become all too familiar. This scene is probably the first part of the game that has had any real difficulty. While you may have died earlier, that was just a lesson. This is a test. The trick is to look out for the animations that are deadly, the shadows that will do several different actions and are programmed well to respond to Andy and their fellow shadows. Only a few will actually be in a position to kill you at any one point and they will kind of telegraph it, especially earlier on. The rest are trying to confuse and dazzle you by flying over and getting in your way or getting into a position where they can then attack. Make sure you take out the lurkers that prowl along the ground then focus on any that get too near and face them if they do so. If you do face them they are more likely to grab you instead of eat you. Crouching and standing up quickly also stops them from simply dodging all out of the way of your laser. This gruelling fight continues for a few scenes and by the end you feel accomplished. It isn't easy and you have to keep alert but it also isn't too hard that you will struggle for too long. Following this is probably my least favourite challenge, question mark? You start seeing these rabbit-like shadows appearing and they run towards you, followed by some lurkers. After blasting your way through the last few scenes, you'd be forgiven trying to shoot them. You can't, these rabbit things are invincible. Instead, you have to jump over them. If you don't, you get knocked off. Not only is this counterproductive to what you just learned, but it doesn't teach you anything for the future as these enemies, these rabbit ones, never return. Luckily, it isn't too difficult, it's just odd. It is also followed by a couple of shadows frog jumping as they are mimicking the rabbit boys that just preceded them. Again, I love this characterization and humor, which is naturally interspersed with the actual gameplay. If that isn't enough, one literally comic book style tries to sneak up on you from behind. I just love everything about that and it kind of undoes everything wrong about these rabbit creatures. We carry on and find our first puzzle that actually requires any inductive reasoning. Yes, it is inductive, not deductive. Sherlock Holmes has been lying to you all this time. We need to get to the path above, but if Andy climbs up that ribcage, he will certainly be eaten by that shadow that is hiding at the top behind some scenery. There is a shadow bumping the ground, making everything shake, and this will make that hidden shadow jump up in the air, but it will also knock us down that ribcage ladder. So it isn't a case of just rushing up. Instead, we have to get Andy to jump as he hits the floor and then we can zap the bugger while he's still in the air. In the next scene, a crack will appear and some highly detailed enemies will smash through and into our path. A cutscene will appear and... Oh no! He, he, he's eaten our gun! What do we do? Well, you can try and stay around these gorgeous looking monsters and ask for it back, I guess? But that doesn't work out for you and... Oh Jesus Christ! Is back was pulled out and snapped. The visceral nature of these deaths really are next level. Not an ounce of blood, but yet it's much more gruesome than a Tarantino film. Okay, that's one way to learn the most painful of lessons. This time, let's run for it. We are chased by a shadow, but we can't fight back, so we have to keep running. And suddenly we reach a thin edge that can only be crossed carefully and slowly. The shadow creeps tentatively behind. This is the best kind of set piece, a brilliant piece of visual storytelling that occurs within the confines of normal gameplay and it's absolutely stunning. We're making it to the other side but it's catching on us and ah, oh, it's destroyed by the smallest crack of sunlight. We're safe but we're certainly not secure, we are without any weapon and we are at the whims of any enemy that we dare come across. Well, no use pouting, that's not what Andy does, we need to carry on. The little lizard-esque shadow shows us the way and we follow dutifully. This lizard was an example used by Frédéric Savoie of something added to the game later to make it more simple and easier to follow at the beginning. I, I can say it's helpful, but I think apart from needing to know that you can climb, it's hardly needed because there's nowhere else to go. Climbing is a key mechanic in Heart of Darkness and these first few scenes give a good introduction to what things you'll need to learn while doing it. You'll need to learn to jump and then press X to grab quickly back on to the next section of wall. Pressing it just when needed and not spamming it, otherwise you fall to your doom. We get to a scene where we can see escape upwards but there's no climbable path to this location. Jumping across and spamming X doesn't work and we've simply fall down to the scene before. This is one of those times when the trial and error style of gameplay just seems off. 
there's no clue what you need to interact with or how and the solution tends to be kind of out of nowhere. If you jump in place at the top of the ledge you will feel the scene shake with both sound and sight giving you a clue that you're on the right idea. Obviously you need to jump up and down until you dislodge the giant skeleton that is embedded in the cliff's face. It then obviously sweeps down and pushes you up to the correct path upwards. That isn't obvious or great gameplay in my eyes. Learning mechanics and a puzzle layout through trial and error is fine as long as you feel like you are actually solving something. If you are interacting with a puzzle to find the bounds of what is possible and using that information to do what is needed, then solving it will feel like a real accomplishment. If you're just trying everything and seeing what works, and that is the extent of the puzzle, well, that's just naff. This is definitely a case of the latter, but luckily this turns out to be the exception and not the rule for Heart of Darkness. Climbing ever upwards, you end up inside the open skull of the giant skeleton. If you don't know what's about to happen, then I think you might be a bit slow. In case you are, there's a little movement in the skull and a sting of music warning you against dilly-dallying and crunch. My my, has Andy been through the ringer. Choosing to jump across and climb ever upwards, Andy has to dislodge another bone to form a path. At least this time you dislodge the bone by climbing upwards, the only thing you can really try and it feels more natural to the pace of the game. We reach the top of the cliff and are joined again by some of Broughton's score that has been absent so far. Instead all we've had is ambient, diegetic sounds and small musical strings that give a quite lonely and harrowsome ambience that works well, especially in juxtaposition to the adventurous score that Broughton brings. The camera is taken away from Andy and towards a swirling bit of darkness, the heart of darkness. The way the scene switches between 2D pixel art and 3D rendering here is seamless and it helps guide you as the POV is taken away from Andy our hero. We are introduced to two new characters, the master and the servant, who act as the big bads. Characters may be a strong word, they are more like archetypes, a condensed idea of the roles they play. We have the snivelling, cowardly servant who does his best to serve his master in order to lessen the beatings. Then we have the master, a big dark force of all that is not good, that treats the servant cruelly as he fails to do his bidding. The idea of a snivelling servant is doubled down on, with him always having snot dripping from his long trunk of a nose, and this pink gooey plastic-like appearance really lends itself to servitude. Now what have you got in the sack? I hope for your sake it's the earth boy you promised me. Bring me the sack, you idiot! I could do all by myself, really! No more dumb side The servant off the back of being thrown against the wall delights in the delivery of what he thinks is a small boy that he has arranged for the master. But oh no, it's whiskey in the bag instead! They were trying to get Andy. The master, angry at his servant's ineptitude, throws the servant against an extremely spike-ridden wall, but a familiar belly gets in the way, that of the large beast that has eaten our laser gun. He informs the master that the boy is around and hundreds of winged bony creatures like that we saw of earlier are sent forth to capture Andy. Well, we know, even if Andy doesn't, that whiskey is in the centre of that menacing castle with the whirlpool of darkness coming out of it. We better push onwards. The top of the canyon is covered in a dense and unforgiving swamp. Again, I think the visuals are just incredible and you get a vivid difference between the cavernous lurking canyon and the overgrown murky swamp. We are still without a weapon and while that sense of evil is still around, this section of gameplay is a lot slower than before and really will get into the puzzle element of this puzzle platformer. The water is dangerous as foretold with the faces of a shadow-like Nessie folding in and out of the service, swimming 
is not an option. Instead, we will use stepping stones. Nice and simple. Just make sure you remember that Andy functions like a human in the way that he builds up to a jump. So if you're running and jumping, press jump before the precipice. There's a rope. We've already used one to open a path, but now we must swing as all good adventurer heroes must. The grabbing of a rope is fairly forgiving and jumping off even more so. I've never actually failed on a rope swinging section in which I blamed the rope. Now, we can jump over towards the exit of this screen, but a big purple vine like plant with a gaping moor is in our way. Trying to go over the open mouth is as stupid as you would guess. Luckily, a little green bug flies into the scene and provides the plant with a chewy meal that keeps the thing occupied and we can jump over in peace. Continuing through the swamp, we see a whole host of plant buggers. Luckily for us, there is a convenient rope that will help us swing over them. I love the way they snap at the air where Andy just was. You land on what you think is a rock, but it turns out to be a large swamp creature's head that bobs you onto the land. This is another example of an unnecessary but lovingly crafted detail that makes the game feel epic in scope. The next area of the swamp is empty with only the water laying in front of Andy. But there isn't any monsters in the water, at least none that we can see. Maybe this water is safe? Ah, it isn't the water that's dangerous, it's the sky. The horrible bony skeleton creatures with their skinny wings have flown from the heart of darkness and found you defenceless. Time to leg it, but trying to do this in the thick swamp water doesn't really work and the slow pace of Andy leads to another brutal killing as Andy's back is broken and he's grabbed and taken through the air. Well, what can we do then? I can imagine this taking quite a while to work out as the solution to this grim problem doesn't stick out that obviously. However, I find it hard to judge the complexity of this puzzle as I knew the answer through exposure to the game as a child. It does stand to reason that if you don't want to be grabbed then you can always duck and you will notice that the swamp rising and falling as you wade through it. If you use this information you can work out quite easily that ducking in the deeper areas of the swamp will leave you out of the reach of the flying bastards. So Andy must wade, wait for a screech of the flyer, duck, then wade to the next deep area. The attacks are performative enough that by using sight and hearing that screech gives you plenty of time to react. Again, sunlight bursting through the canopy saves you as Andy reaches the other end of the pool. The swamp gives way to some ancient stony structure that becomes the setting for the first proper multi-screen puzzle that provides much of the footprint to how we need to approach puzzles going forward. We need to explore the different scenes, look for our way forward and learn what is blocking us from getting there. This does involve a bit of dying. A lot of dying, but I don't necessarily see that as a negative. You're not on a life counter, you aren't losing points or score or doing badly. What you're doing is instead learning the outline of the test ahead of you. Exploring this puzzle, you will see a path upwards and another to the right. The way to the right leads to a dead end with a vine creature near a glowing sack full of green flies. Going upwards will lead to a cave of these plants that prevent Andy from going forward, no matter how well he jumps. Well, we have the way to go and the clues that we need to work out. There are vines in the way and how we need to occupy some of them so we can get through them. One can be pulled down from a ledge near the star. The other can be subdued by the green flies that they choose to munch on. To get these flies to them, Andy must wait for the plant near the sack to eat. He can then jump on that green sack, releasing a bunch of the green flies. They fly upwards and we can meet them at the top of the cave. When the one closest to the cave entrance is busy, a simple run and jump will lead us to the next screen. But here we hit a bit of a snag. As I ran and jumped to safety, the momentum of Andy took him into the next screen. I haven't mentioned it as it hasn't necessarily been an issue so far, but there is a slight awkward delay between each screen. It's not been an issue and it's nowhere near long enough to be annoying, but it is when you are at this speed. This delay and switch between screens can get you killed as you can't react properly to the momentum that you've built up. This issue doesn't rear its head too often, but often enough that it is an actual problem, not just a one-off. If we do fail at that screen, it does take you to the beginning of this slightly longer puzzle. It does feel like quite a long way back, and this can happen a few times where a lot of progress can feel like it's dashed with one small wrong move. However, despite feeling like you've lost a lot of progress, you haven't actually lost that much at all. Once you know what you're doing, each puzzle can be quickly navigated through, and within the minute, I was back to where I died. A simple rope swing followed by crawling gets us out to the other side of the cavern 
and we bump into a rock. It did take me far too long to realise that you had to climb up and push the rock that is above that one to progress. I don't think that's fully on me, but it, it is a bit on me, I guess. Pushing a boulder that is supporting a Jenga-like structure goes as well for Andy as pushing a boulder that is supporting a Jenga-like structure could possibly go. By that I mean he switches to 3D and slides down a rock slide. No, not a rock slide as in a bunch of rocks tumbling down a mountainside, but a slide made out of rock. I, I, I don't want to imagine the absolute state of his coccyx right now. When Andy isn't dying, he actually can be quite lucky. He's left upside down, his leg is caught in a rope, but he's otherwise okay. Well, let's take a breath. Nope, should have done that, this is Heart of Darkness. Of course a giant creature would eat all but Andy's shoe. Heart of Darkness regularly relies on adventure film logic to direct you forward. When you're stuck on something that swings, you swing. Side to side, building up momentum to reach the tree, meaning when the giant sea serpent comes for Andy, he can grab the tree and break off enough to hold open its jaws. When in the water, it's then prudent to swim like hell, so there's no round two between you and the serpent. The land comes to the rescue and instantly becomes steep jungle. A large boulder blocks away, but luckily we can climb up one of the trees. As we follow these trees up, we find a curious sight. Amongst them is a battle between one of the flying skellies and an orange humanoid figure that seems to be wearing shorts as well as having fairy wings. I wonder what this curiously hanging rope does. Obviously it pulls away the canopy and it fries the skeleton, saving the curious orange fella. That takes us into a cutscene. This is Amigo. He is the last main character of the story and from his first moment you know that this guy is the bee's knees. He starts off by sniffing Andy with his derpy face. That is actually void of any nose, so I don't know how he manages it, he just uses his lip. He ends up knocking us over and catching us as we fall. Andy shows no inch of suspicion for Amigo and calls him neat as he allows Amigo to take him up in the air. I'd like to think that if I had been attacked by everything under the sun in such a scary place, including actual plants and actual shadows, that I'd have some reservations about being flown about by some random fairy-like creature. But there's no ounce of menace to Amigo and his dopey charm is infectious, so I guess no harm, no foul. Dark Kingdom! Whoa! There is plenty of menace in those flying skeletons, however, and they begin to chase after the duo, hitting Amigo with a fireball and sending Andy below, and he lands suspiciously luckily in a pool of water. You have got to give it to Andy's hat. He has been through such a lot and it hasn't fallen off once. It's a water level, as is the tradition to any game that's worth its salt. But how do we get out? Well, the only way is up, right? No, that will lead only to a fireball to Andy's mug. Better head down then. Doing so will lead us past a glowing green boulder at the bottom of the pond we're in. It can be missed, but it is hard to, and its odd presence urges you to go and touch it. Doing so will zap Andy, but this is necessary to proceed. We then must continue to swim right and find a path through an underwater cavern. This path leads to an unsubmerged area where you can take a breath. You can drown underwater, even in this beginning section, but it is hard to do so unless you really are faffing about and not swimming onwards. The dry area of the cave is blocked by a bunch of rocks. We can't push them over and we can only struggle against them. This is just another instance where you just need to try everything under the sun before you realise that by touching that green rock you have actually provided Andy with new powers. Pressing circle now shoots green energy in place of our gun. What's more is that by pressing trichle you can harness a lot of this energy into one large charged shot. This is enough to smash these rocks away. To do this is a bit of a mitigated guess. You will have had to have gone by the rock and you will have had to press the right buttons that you aren't necessarily prompted to do so. But you are funneled by design towards that green glowing rock. It is something that you are more than likely if you are following any sort of clues from the environment to go towards. And when it comes to pressing the right buttons, it is fair to say that if you 
were to just mash buttons you will likely come across it but you also have the booklet that explains that you can do this with powers and as I've said before you are expected to have read the booklet back in these days it's just weird how reluctant Amazing Studio was to have anything that isn't diegetic on screen it doesn't want to take you out of the adventure well overall I think this is a good idea and it's better to have things brought up naturally rather than coming up on the screen I feel like in this case it is hard to introduce a new power to the protagonist without saying press this which might have helped the next screen shows us what looks like a weird rock but is actually a seed and these seeds are going to be super important when it comes to navigating through this weird world the first time that we need to use a seed is in this scene where we must use this seed to help us get up and reach a ledge we cannot reach by simply jumping. We need to use our charged shot on the seed to make it grow into a climbable tree of sorts. I wouldn't expect you to know that using your charged shot on the seed will make it grow but it is expected that you would try your newfound powers on this suspicious looking thing in the middle of the room. So this case I give a pass to and it is a good way of teaching the player actually to move seeds into positions where grown trees can be made into a place where they are helpful. You are tested on this premise as you knock a seed across a small piranha shadow infested pond in order to grow a tree that will lead you onwards. After that it's back into the water we go and it's just a case of following the underwater path to its exit. Well it's not just that, there are now a few things that will kill you underwater. Firstly there are these big pulsating cauldron looking things that either suck or blow the water in front of it. Getting sucked into one of these cauldrons leads to death. There are also the tendrils that stick out of the sides of the path. Getting stuck in one of these leads to death. This section is also longer, so running out of air leads to death. All in all, there's a fair few things that lead to death. Again though, running out of oxygen is hardly a real worry, as even waiting in front of a bunch of tendrils in order to time your movement so you're not sucked off is fine and there are plenty of obvious pockets of air that you pass that you're encouraged to make use of. One of these pockets appears in a scene but is actually on a different path to where Andy is currently. This actually signals to the player to take Andy that way later in order to give him a breather. The real challenge is the cauldron blowers and suckers and learning which way to push and pull Andy so you can navigate a proper route through them. Though they do show you which way they blow and suck by the bubbles in front of them but it may take a few deaths to really work out the best way through them. Reaching the top of water shows you an actual quite fun use of these cauldrons as one tries to blow you into the jaws of these deadly plants that have returned again. Once you've timed yourself to swim through a several dangers you will hear the familiar hissing of these deadly plants and you're faced with a climbable wall that has four of them. It's a death trap but now at least Andy can fight back. Hitting the vines with a charged shot stuns them and stops them biting you. This makes it possible to stun the first one and jump onto the wall without getting eaten. While on the wall you will need to stun more as you go but unlike your laser you can use your powers while climbing. You can take this quite slowly stunning and re-stunning the plants as you shimmy downwards or you can just jump for it. Once past them, however you choose to do so, we come across another new enemy and it's a frustrating one at that. These creatures look straight out of Oddworld with their worm-like body and mandibles that extend around a central eye. They appear and disappear burrowing in and out of the rock face and take a hit to inflate and after a while they fly off and die but you can speed this process up by hitting them again. This often is necessary so they don't get in the way of you trying to hit another one before it gets you. If they pop out close to Andy and are not hit quickly they will grab Andy and drag them into his hole killing him in a horrible animation in which you can only see his feet struggle before they suddenly drop and he's taken into their hole. Getting through them horrible creatures leads to the largest multi-part puzzle yet. The objective is simply just to get to the right of the scene and this is achieved by growing seeds in these little islands. However not all the seeds are in this area yet and so we must collect them. We can see one bobbing in the water but the water is infested with them tiny piranha like shadow creatures and so pushing it is just out of the option because going in the water will end up killing us. However there's a stone in the water that seems to block an underwater passage at the bottom left of the scene. This looks intriguing and anything that looks intriguing in Heart of Darkness is worth investigating. To get to that underwater path in a relatively safe way 
we must first go left into another scene and use a different seed to lead us upwards. Pass some plants, through some worms, before we climb down to another entrance to the water. This is the only possible route to go and is the most obvious thing for you to do through the process of elimination. The water here leads to that underwater path and it is also absent of them killer piranhas. By swimming Andy along that underwater path and pushing that boulder, this creates a surge of current that pushes that floating seed along to that island where we want it. We can't follow it onto that ledge however as the piranha shadows are kind of in the way and they're starting to take notice of us. Andy has to swim against the current back along that underwater path to safety. There's this dramatic escape which has the perfect timing in its execution and is naturally implemented again in a proper set piece. We need to go back up and over to our start location while also remembering to turn that tree that we used back into a seed and knocking that also into the water. It floats along, knocking the other seed into the next screen and then escape is just a simple case of jumping from one tree to another, growing more as and when you need. Don't get too low on any of the trees however, as the piranhas turn out to jump. I found out this the hard way. When you know what you're doing, this puzzle actually only takes a couple of minutes to accomplish, but it easily could have you working for about half an hour as you slowly work out the next section of the puzzle and what works and what way and what you need to go where. But never do you feel cheated by the solution. You may be annoyed or frustrated, but never cheated. The next few screens see us push ever upwards, climbing up the cave. There isn't much that is hard to do here, but there is a re-emergence of some of them lurker shadows. But a few saps with your new power set them straight. Going up further, you will hear them before you see them. Our old nemesis, the shadows, and they've come in greater numbers. They appear from the sides, and a few shots can only thin them out and not eliminate them. There's just too many. The trick is just to run to the next scene, grow a tree, climb it, and take pot shots from a ledge. Finally, Andy finds himself outside of another cave, tiptoeing across another thin pathway but it starts to crumble away from him and and he's about to fall when amigo comes to the rescue with another exploratory venture into the sky amigo takes us to his home on the quintessential fantasy trope of the flying continent Again, this is another beautiful and well-directed scene that, that takes us through some lovely cinematics and lovely scenery, but it suffers through its frame rate. An idyllic tribal village with clear blue water that rushes into a waterfall. Amigo, which turns out to be the name of the species as well as him, introduces us to all the other Amigos. All funny and derpy as he, but with their own quirks to boot. I've given them my own names based on the Smurf naming system. There is Greedy Amigo, Saucy Amigo, Nerdy Amigo, and Background Amigos. After Andy meets them and nearly gets his arm bitten off, we are told that the Amigos are actually vegetarian and running out of food. Fortunately for them, they found Chekhov's apple and are sharing it between them all. Andy knows how to produce produce and zaps the apple into a massive apple tree. And the Amigos, with no thought of rationing, thinking about it, that's probably why they're in this issue in the first place. Well, they have a wonderful feast nonetheless. There is that usual great attention to character environment in these cutscenes, with each background and crafted element showing us lots about these generic characters with quite little material. Enough to bring them to life and make us care for them after just a couple of minutes. The frame rate is still a problem too, but overall the charming nature of the cutscene prevails through it. But it all does feel a bit dodgy for a better word. The amigos I mean. They're broken English, they're 
druggy, silly elder and backwards lifestyle does play on stereotypes of indigenous people that aren't kind, nor are they accurate. This is diluted though by their overwhelmingly kind nature and that they don't actually bear any resemblance to any actual human, but it is something worth pointing out and worth not completely glossing over. We cut to the evening where the named amigos are in a circle with the elder amigo, known for his love of the pipe and supposed wisdom. And he is telling his story in a way that is reminiscent to me of C-3PO recalling the Tower of the Rebels to the Ewoks. The amigos chant for their elder's wisdom, and we can see the characterization again of each amigo is present in the background, with the greedy amigo even taking time out to scratch his... I don't really want to imagine what's there. With a deep inhale of the shisha on his hooker pipe, the elder tells of his prophecy of Andy coming. I know why you come. My vision eye sees all there is. This prophecy is literally just a picture of a stick man, and the elder's like, Look, th this is you. You're the stick man. And I absolutely love this. This joke is mwah, a star material. The Elder says he knows exactly what Andy's looking for and that he's seen this in a dream. And he gets out another picture and says, look, this is what you were looking for. Except for on this picture is a big titty amigo girl. It's literal pool. Oops, wrong dream apparently. I have nothing against nudity. I, I don't even think that nudity is inherently adult in nature and could be in something which is something that is available for everyone. But not in the form of masturbatory material that is clearly not for artistic purposes. I'm not sure it should be in an E-rated game, but it is funny nonetheless. Getting back to the senses, the Elder states that there is great danger where Andy is heading in his quest and that he should stay in the village where it's safe. There's no worries here, they've never been attacked. I have spoken! Cue the explosion with comic timing. The comedy doesn't last long though as we see amigos killed and their huts burned. This isn't an attack, it's a pillaging. Anyway, with the invasion of the Amigo village, we end disc one, and we must do that ancient ritual of changing discs. Disc two starts with a bang, literally. You're in the heart of the village, and the flying skellies swarm about, wreaking chaos and raining fire down upon Andy and the Amigos. We've seen these enemies before, but this is the first time that we get to properly fight them, and they are not an easy enemy. They shoot fireballs at Andy and one hit sees him shrivel up into ash. We haven't seen battle, not really, since we had our gun and this is quite a big return to it. You have to learn to dodge the fireballs by either ducking or jumping over them or running side to side. Remember, Andy doesn't move instantly so you have to predict and learn the tales of an enemy attack so you can move in time. Fighting with the green powers is also a bit different to the gun. There's no reason to use your charged attack on any enemies as most die in one hit and the charging animation takes far too much time. But you do have to be a bit better timed than when you're using your gun as fine projectiles is not just one continuous beam. The tricky to finagle diagonal shots are necessary and you will get better at them as you are pushed into combat more and more. Technically, this game is joystick compatible. Remember the original dual stick controller didn't actually have any joysticks, but it doesn't really work and Andy is definitely designed with buttons in mind and that's fine, just something to bear in mind. This small area of continuous combat took me far too long to complete, 
but it was a nice change of pace from the quite slow puzzle areas that had preceded it. Anyway, after many deaths, you'll end up on a rope bridge. Another adventure trope occurs when the rope is blasted in real time by the flyers and Andy falls with it, holding on for dear life. We must now use the bridge as a ladder as we jump across a ledge further down the floating continent. We have to get back up and can do so with the use of a seed that we grow and make into a tree and that helps us upwards. But the only problem is that this projects a horrific shadow that will attack us and we're unable to climb up. But by pushing the seed along the edge, uh, we can get it to an area where there's no backdrop and so therefore no shadow and so we can safely climb up. Jumping onto the cliff face, we engage with the most complex bit of climbing yet. Tree branches will jut out often in the next few screens and they have some shadows that will attack us and make us fall. We can survive a shortfall by quickly pressing X and grabbing back on, but you may have fallen down a few scenes. You can climb back up, but what stops them attacking is by using a charge shot to that branch. They will re-energize soon after, so you do have to go fast and get past them. We also come across a few enemies while dealing with these damn tree roots. The little worm pests are back and they can easily surprise you as they can be sporadic and clever with their movements. Spamming your shot doesn't work against them as the game is quite clever and knows what you're doing and so where you're firing they tend to leave alone. You have to be a bit clever and move from side to side and change target and selectively spam your shot. This is hard to do when you're moving through branches quite quickly but the additional variation on the game's mechanics is very welcome. Over these screens we're also trying to solve a puzzle of sort that ranges over multiple screens. Disc 1 was all about learning the mechanics, Disc 2 is more about combining them together and testing you. It may have taken a while but this layered mechanical design does come into its own and is what you want from a puzzle platformer. The way to go is through a wooden locked gate that has flyers to greet us on the other side. How do we open this gate? Well, you can see a pulley and string going from it to another screen and by following that you can see that this rope is tied to a boulder. The most obvious thing that I thought to do was to fire at the boulder but this just didn't work. So we had to go a bit more imaginative. There is a ledge that is lurking quite near it, so getting there seems like a good idea. You can try and fight these bloody worms and branches that are in the way to getting there, but actually you can sneakily jump past them. As you go along the ledge, you can see Andy's shadow in the backdrop coming close to the boulder shadow, and when they meet, Andy's shadow pushes the boulder free, and I thought that was quite fun to do. As this drops, we hear the scratch of the flyers. They're coming, and they're coming to kill and you have to get them before you have any chance of progressing. Trying to dodge them while you're climbing is very challenging due to your lack of speed and direction. You can climb back up and try and go quickly back to the open gate, but this is quite hard to do because of the positioning of the branches and it kind of encourages you to instead drop down and quickly grab onto another part of the wall that is in a below screen. This actually takes you to the next screen before the gate and so it's actually an easier way and it shows that even making Andy fall can actually be the right solution to a puzzle. This is all quite simple enough in of itself but can be challenging to get all the bits right in one go, especially in your first attempt at the game. And this shows that the game is trying to do that little bit more. Once you're past that gate, the next puzzle seems quite simple enough, just jump from one part to another. But you'll see rocks are tumbling down from above. This is easy enough to dodge, but if you don't know when it's coming, it can catch you out at first. Once you're past that, you can see that it's actually one of them gorilla-like shadows that is banging on the ground, that is causing all these rocks to fall. All you have to do is time your movements well, but the shadows can be quite sporadic with when they bang the ground. They do give off enough clues to make it easy enough to dodge. and once you're on their level, you can zap them into the netherworld. Up and up we go even further and look, a lovely new monster, a spider shaped shadow and I hope that none of you are arachnophobic as they are going to multiply endlessly below you. Fun! You can try and fight them but it is impossible, they gobble up Andy no matter how good your reactions and you have to climb up as quickly as your little legs will carry you. Heart of Darkness enjoys its chase sequences and the game is full of them. Even this small one that is just racing against spiders to the summit of the cliff face feels very dramatic. The blob of darkness that is formed by the spiders gains on Andy 
but as he reaches the top, the gravity of the mountain reverses as he is at the bottom of the mountain. I, I, I don't really know. Don't ask. I don't really think it's that important. As he falls into 3D and off the mountain, he screams, and with no amigo to help him this time, and he shoots drastically at the floor that is coming increasingly towards him. He hits a few plants, and luckily they grow, and he ricochets off their leaves onto a soft flower that cushions his fall. The floor of this unnerving area is absolutely packed with shadows, and fighting through it is actually quite reminiscent of that earlier village section. Lava follows the intense battle as it provides the danger to Andy for the next section of platforming. Jumping from platform to platform that disintegrates slowly after being jumped on while avoiding spurts of lava will become the new norm for Andy. I like how the shoots of lava will not only get in the way of the jumping but also our climbing as we go back over and around the rock wall. Different elements are used more than once. Andy does love to climb awkwardly and that needs to be stated as he actually uses the jut in the wall rather than moving threely in a climbing zone kind of like you do in something like Tomb Raider. This means he will sometimes stick a hand out a bit further out than what you'd expect. This wasn't a problem until now as before it didn't see him sticking his hand out into the way of molten rock. This isn't too difficult to negotiate. If you avoid getting too close, there is always, even in the later sections of the game, plenty of time to climb past any danger. Learning to give more space than necessary is actually the way to go. Climbing further round, we meet our new friend, the Spider Shadow, that has two states we learn. Their first state is to stay away from Andy, spitting out green juices above him that slowly drip down between each hole in the wall. If Andy puts a hand or foot onto this goo, he will fall, and in this area, that fall is deadly, as he's not got enough time to grab back onto the wall before he hits the lava. The spider's next state is its attack state, where it'll jump around quickly towards Andy, but not always directly, trying to pounce next to him and gobble him up. They are real devils like that, and they avoid your fire and can quickly turn around to attack out of nowhere. This is actually quite similar to the worms, but I find that the spiders were much more consistent with how often they got me. Past that section is a quick puzzle that I considerably overthought. So much so that I was stuck on it for probably half an hour when it's literally 10 seconds long. The top shadow will bang on the ground making you fall down if you climb too high. You only need to climb up high and quickly blast him before he gets a chance to knock the ground to progress. I assumed there was more to it than that and the game was actually just testing your reactions. Destroying all the enemies after that is easy and you just carry on. There are still more lava caves to explore and the next section is simple in that you just have to get onto a ledge, shoot some flyers while you can still easily dodge them before climbing under and around, dodging the spurts of lava below. As is becoming a theme with Heart of Darkness, now Andy must travel up. As we do so, we will face two screams of climbing combat. The first one is a real test against the spider bastards. Shooting straight up does stop them from dropping goo above you as they will stay out of the way of fire, but you will not kill them. You can wait for them to turn on their attack mode so they're more vulnerable to your attacks. This is a bit of a gamble as they're very quick to pounce and kill you. You do find a knack to moving about and varying your shots without spamming, just like with the worms, and that does seem to get them more often than not, but you will find yourself stepping into their goo. Here, it isn't as problematic as it was before, as you have another area below to fall to, and that gives you enough time to grab back on and climb back up. Just be wary that the goo does transition between scenes as well. They won't drop any more if you're not in the same scene as them. And also the goo does disappear when you touch it. So you can basically get rid of it and then go back up. Fighting the spiders is a new challenge, but you settle into a rhythm and you eventually overcome them. And you do all that so you can fight some more spiders. This time they have their friends, the worms with them. And I think this is probably the hardest part of combat so far. And it, it can actually seem quite unfair. Yet I did find myself enjoying this combat more and more as the new elements are slowly added to each other. And it's pressing you to get better slowly and slowly. We reach the top of yet another cliff and see that we have edged closer to the castle at the heart of darkness. Andy poses quite flamboyantly 
As the scene cuts to Whiskey, who's being taunted by the servant over his capture. It gives us another glimpse into the servant's cruel and insipid behaviour. We ain't done with the lava though, and there are a few more climbing sections that involve jumping with the correct timing, dealing with certain enemies, and using previously learnt techniques in new and interesting ways. The longest section involves getting to a platform so you can safely deal with the flies that come at you. Before climbing then under these platforms, dodging the lava spurts as you do in order to reach a seed, knocking this seed forward to the other side of the wall so that you can use it later, before going back past the way you came, dodging the spurts again, going back up to the platforms, jumping along, jumping down to where the seed now is, turning it into a tree so that you can now climb up it and reach the ruts above to climb to the next puzzle. All of these things are not too difficult in of themselves, and I've probably said that before, but patience can be fickle, and I ended up struggling for far too long to get this done. What's worse is when I finally got to them ruts, just as I was climbing away from this section, more flyers came down. They telegraphed their appearance with a fireball that shoots just before you can actually reach them. And I actually let out a maniacal laugh as this twist really did get me and ended up making me panic a bit too much. It took me a lot more attempts to get back to that area again as any essence of temperance had left me and I kept rushing into trouble over again. Luckily that is the last part of the section and so when I finally made it through I was able to rest my sweaty fingers, wipe my brow and watch another charming cutscene. Amigo reappears and begs Andy for help. Andy, help! Amigos need you! Look! What's wrong? We're tired! The surviving villagers are losing strength and it's a death sentence for them. Andy, we cannot touch ground! We make shadow to the spot! Mano! They need to fly as if they touch the darkness on the floor. They turn. Their shadows engulf them and twist their kind souls into those of the flying skeletons that we've been fighting all along. This is quite scary in a classic children's movie kind of way. It kind of reminds me of how I used to be scared of Dark Crystal and them rollerblading freaks in Return to Oz as a child. Amigo thinks that if they had the powers that Andy got from the stone, that that will protect them. I don't know how he reaches this conclusion, but he does, and he asks Andy to show him the stone. They set him down on pillar-like rocks that are quite near the stone, but this causes them to descend with Andy in tow. Like me, that might be the most brutal death scene. <laughs> it's also quite funny, but in all seriousness, Andy's deaths have become synonymous with this game, and people think that it is all just one big gimmick. But I think there's a design reason for these. Yes, Andy will die often, and he will die brutally, but this game is all about trial and error, and these humorous, varied and unique death animations make the error part more enjoyable. The game has already mitigated any annoyance a player might have had with the constant death by having fairly quick reloads, and Amazing Studio have doubled down on this philosophy by making making a mistake quite enjoyable. This pillar section is quite short and sweet with the only difficulty coming from having to quickly fire off a charged shot at a seed to block a pillar from crushing Andy. Though again I got stuck here for far more time than I am willing to admit as I thought I'd tried pressing a button at the side of a path and it turns out I just ran at the button and not pressed it. You need to slow down just before and touch it instead of just run straight at it like a ball in a china shop. Once I'd pressed that button it was just a simple case of fighting a few shadows, timing some movement, pushing a seed underneath this strangely dangling pillar that we see the green power rock resting on. Zapping the seed and making it grow sends the boulder upwards and Andy emerges from the water with it. 
How he did so, I have no idea. And again, this isn't important. What is important is the Amigos are able to imbue themselves with that rock's power. Instead of actually cutting away, we get a quick small battle with some flying skellies. This time we have the Amigos helping us, both in the foreground and in the background. To end this scene, Amigo grabs you, but you can try and run away from him, but I wasn't able to manage to on this case. Broughton's score starts off again with some classical feeling to battle music. As it plays, the Amigos march, well, hover, to war, taking Andy towards the castle. Their arrival is not without resistance though, and their skeleton counterparts engage them in battle. But now the Amigos can at least match them. Amigo Amigo drops Andy off at the base of the castle and then leaves to join his brethren in the great battle of the dark swept sky. We are in the end game. We have a greeting party waiting for us on the outside of the dark castle. It's the familiar flyers, shadows and lurkers and they fill the screen with death and it'd be a bit of a handful but nothing impossible after all that practice we've had before. Chains now adorn the climbable paths and this adds a bit of gothic menace to the whole vibe, but whiskey is waiting and so we must set forth. Getting inside the castle we are introduced to the last of the regular baddies. These soldier looking fellows with rhino-esque faces are much more tanky than the enemies that we've encountered before. They take a good few normal hits or a charged hit to take down and they shoot back as well, firing small fireballs for you to duck under or they take a deep breath giving you plenty of time to prepare and then they blow a bigger ball of fire along the ground for Andy to jump over. That isn't their last trick. After downing these soldiers, you see that they turn into two egg sacs. This is getting out of hand. Now there are two of them. Yep, of course, they respawn from the eggs if you don't hit them quickly with some small attacks or using one quick charge blast to destroy an individual egg. Fortunately for us, this soldier, as I will be calling them, is on his own and pretty simple to take down, that won't last for long. The next section of this morose looking castle is the most expansive part of the game, with Andy needing to hit several switches in order to unlock his progress down into the depths and onwards towards Whiskey. The first part of this labyrinth involves a chain bridge that you need to walk across. Trying to run across will result in Andy falling. You also need to stop halfway along the chain so that you can dodge attacks from some flyers and fire back at them. And after you've done that, you're free to go right towards the first real battle against these soldiers. There are two of them, for now, and they are supported by lurkers hanging above. The issue with this is that often the lurkers, or even the second soldier, will get in the way of the dropped eggs of a downed soldier. This makes it likely that you won't be able to kill off both eggs before they respawn. You can easily end up getting greedy and not dodging a fireball or hitting a lurker above as you're trying to end your constant death and get rid of them sacks of soldiers as quickly as possible. If you do get through that, there is what seems to be a simple timing challenge where you need to run and jump over a button to the right in order to avoid the columns crushing our ginger head friend. But first make sure you swap the shadow at the end because running into him isn't advised. If you achieve that, you're on to the next section. And this involves a lovely fight with worms on a vast climbing wall, zapping some lurkers, hitting a switch that releases even more lurkers before climbing back up where we came and avoiding death by spider consumption. And that's one switch down, but now we need to go back to where we came from in order to find the other switch. Instead of going right where we fought the soldiers, we can go down and this will lead us to an area where there are several floor buttons that we need to press. The first one that you come across knocks out some blocks that you need to jump and climb on because if you fall down you'll land on one of these buttons. Doing so will open both exits to the platform and a flood of enemies will eviscerate Andy. By climbing down we can take one group at a 
time. Once we've done that, going left will lead to the other switch and by going right, we will now be able to go to the new open pathway. All this seems quite simple, but fights here, especially with the soldiers, are much harder than what we've done before. But at least the game saves when you manage to press either of the two switches needed to open that passage way forward. I actually completed them in the opposite order to which I presented them, which is probably not the most efficient way, but in the attempt where I managed to do this, I fell on the chain bridge, and instead of dying, you're brought closer to that second puzzle area, but there's this branching path that leads you back up to where that first switch is. All of this area can be quite overwhelming, figuring out what does what and where to go. I spent well over an hour trying to get through this menagerie of puzzles that this section provides. It turned out that my final attempt at she only took a few minutes. This could be seen as a negative. However, that ignores the point of Heart of Darkness. The exploring of an area and its intricacies is part of the fun. In such an expansive set of scenes, you really have to notice bits and pieces moving to your input, to different noises that the game makes when you press buttons or work out if there are any enemies hiding around the corner. Yes, I did get mightily frustrated, but I thoroughly enjoyed it nonetheless, as I was being tested in every way this game could imagine, and each test was fair. After that exploring, we are back to more linear levels, and the last real mechanic of the game is introduced. There is a clear path to climb from one side of the screen to the other, but in the way lies half a dozen of them worm boys. Underneath lies a soldier, and he seems somewhat unimportant because he can't fire up, he doesn't seem to be blocking our path. If we do try and climb across, we will be eaten by them worms. There are far too many of them, and they are programmed to dodge your blasts here. This may seem unfair, but there's always a way through, and the answer falls on the soldier your eye has been drawn to. What's going on with him? Well, we can go down to the bottom platform and attack him through a hole in the wall, but this does not let you aim at his offspring, as that hole is not big enough. At first, you think this is a bit of a trick of the developers, but actually, it's a way of framing the puzzle to help you learn this new mechanic, and that is that worms love eating soldiers. By zapping the soldier into many different soldiers over and over again, you actually distract the worms for long enough for you to sneak on by. I do think that this is quite an intelligent way of introducing this mechanic so that you can't screw up by accident by destroying them soldier and its eggs. After a few more bits of jumping about, we last come across our faithful friend Whiskey. Unfortunately, between us is that pink servant and a load of them shadows that quickly grab onto us and they can't be shrugged off like normal. In that cutscene, he throws us into the prison with Whiskey. These scenes really show off how much of a cruel dickhead that servant is. He takes pleasure in the torture of suffering of us, despite having the same treatment done to him. I guess hurt people hurt people. The servant's animation even mocks us as we're now trapped with Whiskey in a prison of his creation. Snot bars and all. Well, we have powers, and a charged shot to the conveniently placed seed above is enough to knock it from the roof, and then we can grow a tree to safety. You can see the servant's animation turn from one from mocking to worry very quickly when this happens, and I think I love that little bit of extra effort brought to bring him to life. We dislodge another boulder that rolls down and towards a servant, and we see him run to the safety of the cell we were just in, with whiskey slipping out at his expense. Sadly, we are separated from our dog friend again, and we must find another way around. I don't know why you can't go through that way where the boulder goes, but that is just the way the game works. Before setting off, I did try and carve a new orifice out of the servant, but sadly his cowering works, though I did make sure to, out of spite, destroy the tree before I leave. As we venture further into the unknown, we get another chance to feed a soldier and his offspring to worms. What follows is an extended battle sequence where we really get to show off our powers and their shadow slaying ability. It would be a real shame if someone got rid of those superpowers, wouldn't it? Oh look, a cutscene, and it seems that the servant has escaped and very quickly, suspiciously quickly, found the green rock we inherited our power from. In a fit of rage from the master, who hates anyone having power except for him, he destroys the rock and the chance of a peasant's revolution led by that Bolshevik-like servant. 
powerless again. Well, I don't want to jump down into that mob of enemies that hide among a backdrop of what look like statues of slaves holding up the castle walls. That's pretty grim and actually reminds me of that statue in the Ministry of Magic in Harry Potter after Voldemort takes power. Sadly, there's only one way to go and that down towards the mob. As they close in, in another great sequence, the fire from a soldier burns away the wooden platform we're on as we jump over it and this allows us to fall to safety, well, relative safety, before another chase begins. This one actually involves some input on our part, not just holding right. Jumping over lurkers, slowing ourselves to tiptoe across chains with hundreds of shadows lying beneath. Then we must quickly urge a lurker towards one side of the screen before jumping over them and crawling away as quickly as possible, before pushing a button and repeating the process and climbing away. We are now free to run along where we were before falling into relative safety, and this leads us to a hole, a hole that we can't resist the pull of. And yes, we jump down. Straight into a familiar beast's gob. With all the death that we have gone through, you would be forgiven for thinking that this was just an elaborate death scene, but lo and behold, the game hasn't restarted and actually has loaded up a new screen with that fat monster in the dead centre. Wasn't he the one who ate our laser gun? Yes, that was him. And by pressing the shoot button, circle, we can give this knob some serious indigestion. I love this little shadow next to him noticing what's going on as his belly bulges with blue energy. And he starts pointing it out to all his friends as we blast out of the big belly of the beast with our gun back in hand. It's a good thing that this guy doesn't like to chew, though I could have sworn that he did bite down on some of our gun. Having the gun back is a real blast, literally. It's continuous wave of damage feels much more potent than what we had before. It also makes the game feel like it's coming full circle as it nears its end. Fighting of soldiers also shows us that the beam from Andy's gun widely oscillates as it extends making it less likely to hit eggs that are further away. This isn't a big issue, it's just something that you need to bear in mind and it means that getting closer is more efficient even if it is more dangerous. Once we fought through some of these monsters, we are once again acquainted with the servant and his sniveling ways. But apparently, he didn't want to steal our dog and he didn't want to attack us. He just was a lowly servant, bullied by a master. Nice story, real believable. He wants a truce in order to help us reform the powered rock and to drop it on his master, destroying him and setting everyone free. For getting whiskey, we aim to collect all the remaining chunks of the power rock and bring them back to the servant. This is the last puzzle section of the game. It mainly involves working a route through a chasm of ladders and traps for yourself, while also working it out for the chunk of powered rock that you need to take along with you as you go. Most of these solutions are pretty obvious for the most part and involve a simple glance at your environment. The only difficult part of this puzzle is more to do with the close proximity to some soldiers that you get to later on. And that might be just my impatience talking. The only innovative part of these final puzzles is that you have to use your gun to fire the rocks along in certain parts that you can't actually reach, and it's obvious to anyone with half a brain. This isn't the worst brain tickler the game has given us, but it is compounded by Andy having to go over the same ground a couple of times, and also the fact that this is the end of the game and being average is just not good enough. It doesn't utilise what made Heart of Darkness's puzzles really quite interesting and that is the engaging and challenging environment and dramatic escapes or solutions. Be careful, it's the last piece. After we've done all the hard work, the servant lets us know that there's still a bit missing. And what plonker is gonna go and grab it? Andy, of course. The large fragment is also at the end of the bridge that looms over the whirlpool of darkness. Well, that sounds safe. 
We get a nice and informative hand point in the direction we need to go now, and Andy pops off. Wasn't there a reason we came here? I can't think of any. We follow the servant's whims and carry on down further into the depths of the castle, but as soon as we are out of sight, the servant plays more tricks. Whiskey happens to come across him and is kicked into the horrible pit of darkness by the servant. He really is a nasty piece of work, squirming and begging to anyone who actually threatens him and then taking his demons out on those who he seems as weaker. I ain't a real fan of the snot, but the servant really does come into his own as an antagonist. His presentation and actions really make you hate every inch of him and only a child could actually trust him. His portrayal is exactly what it needs to be and, and his voice actor does a great job of creating a character that worms around the edges of everything nasty. A few more sapped shadows later we come across a recognisable heap of spikes. A certain servant's pink ass was heading straight towards these at speed earlier. We must be near the bridge and indeed we are. There it is, the foot of the bridge and getting on it is just a case of destroying an admittedly large group of shadows. This is somewhat of a formality that does require attentiveness, if not skill, at this stage of the game. Further along the bridge we have to deal with even more shadows, as half the screen is blotted out with them. It's not too hard, that is until we hear the earth and air quake around us, heralding the arrival of the master. And I have to say, who cares? We've had about 5 seconds of screen time with him, and none of it is actually with Andy. He comes across as a big baddie in name only. We do know that it was his plot to capture Whiskey, and he definitely is a bit of a bell end, but honestly, I just forgot about him. The voice actor does an okay job, but isn't given enough material to work with to become the main antagonist this game deserves. The only interesting feature about him is his similarity to Andy's teacher, who also hasn't been there since the opening cinematic. I have more thoughts on this, but it coincides with the ending, and that's not too far off now. The master appears in the background of the scene and floats about like a fly that's eaten too many pies and occasionally charges before shooting a double ground fireball. You have to do a double jump over these and it might take a few attempts to get the timing right as you have to jump as soon as the fireballs hit the screen as it takes Andy that long to build up his jump. The real difficulty here is just keeping your attention on everything that's happening all at once. It's easy to get distracted, it's easy to get greedy in your quest to get rid of the shadows and keeping one eye always on the master is a must. The difficulty only ramps up further by providing another screen filled with shadows, but they and the master are joined also by two soldiers. This is easily the most difficult combat screen as soldiers draw you in, imploring you to act quickly and destroy their eggs. This is dangerous and shadows will keep getting in the way, making the process longer and while shooting down it's harder to dodge the fireballs from the master. I thought that by going back a screen would give me some distance and allow me to pick off some of the shadows before focusing on the soldiers. This is a no-no and turning back leads to an instant death by a waiting shadow that's ready to engulf you. The strategy that worked for me was focusing Focusing on the shadows and if a soldier went down, only worrying about killing one of their eggs, keeping a maximum of two of them alive. Once the shadows are clear, you can take them down with little fuss, as the master isn't a real test, except to your patience, which again I found quite difficult. And there we are, we found the last piece of the power stone. Andy waves the last shard above his head and we see that the amigos have captured the servant and brutally rolled the power stone over him, bursting his eyeball. Oh, sorry. They dangle the power stone down so Andy can jump to it and insert the final shard, completing the power stone. With a scream of outdated slang, Andy restores the power stone and it falls into the pit of darkness. 
This causes an explosion of force and the darkness starts to implode in of itself, dragging the master down with it. As he falls, he grabs Andy by the ankle and pulls him into the heart of darkness. Amigo looks on in horror as the master echoes the word of your teacher. As they both sink into nothingness. The game loads in this near darkness and a faint outline of Andy can be seen amongst grey and purple hues that burst through the air like smoke before forming into claws. You have to swing your gun because it won't fire at these claws and demons stopping them from enveloping Andy into the abyss. This can actually happen if you don't attack a shade in time or if you let a claw fall on you after you've destroyed its wrist. The overwhelming absoluteness of the dark here and the peril of Andy is fully realised in what is unashamedly an artistic attempt to realise the fear of all things dark. But if you survive long enough, a light opens in the background. The light that is brought forward turns out to be from Andy's mum, who has come to get him from the treehouse for dinner. She is escorted by Whiskey, who struggles through the junk and mess that Andy has made while playing make believe. It's late. Come on, boys. Time for dinner. Okay, Whiskey. Let's see. The final part of the cutscene has Whiskey and Andy heading to their room to. Oh my god, what is that? He is wearing a toddler's baby grow, or onesie as Americans call it. This kid goes to and from school by tram on his own, is learning about the complexities of space, but also wears full body baby pajamas that even have footsies. What age is Andy? Both of them. Forgetting about that odd piece of clothing, we can see some influences to Andy's dreams in the background of his bedroom. He has a film poster about a canyon, which was the starting location, if you remember, and some of his toys are quite reminiscent of the enemies that we've come across. Andy settles down into bed before cruelly teasing Whiskey with his shadow. Afraid of the dark? Hurt people, hurt people, I guess. They make up and Andy hesitantly turns off the light. And that's that. Night whiskey. That's Heart of Darkness. If you're watching along, you'll see there's a lot of fun extra animation going on playing through these credits of Heart of Darkness with that servant playing around and doing his bits and pieces. That further exaggerates that this game is all about a full experience, an adventure epic that mimics the likes of E.T., The Goonies and the other blockbusters that have that same kind of thing in the credits. Talking about the ending of the game, it is a bit of a whiplash. It gets a lot right and probably just as much wrong. The plot of Heart of Darkness isn't that important in a grand sense. The motivations of characters don't need to be complex and not everything needs deep lore and explanation. It just isn't that kind of story. The simple premise of a boy doing everything to save his dog is the simple thrust we need to get us through this game. But that thrust is lost when we meet up with Whiskey again and Andy seems ambivalent and he seems to forget his mission almost suddenly. This is all the more so because we have no reason to be invested in the fight against the master. The conniving servant is much more fleshed out as a character and especially after kicking Whiskey into the abyss, I wish we could have fought him instead. In fact, I think this could have worked wonders. The more interesting real antagonist attacks our friend after we help him and support his rise as the true villain. Either way, the driving force towards the end just happened to lag. And right at the death, so did the gameplay. And this is supposed to be the climax, and it was just a damp squib. The last puzzle was lacklustre as I went over, but the bridge segment was just as bad, if not worse. 
It would have been okay, maybe, as a section, but it hardly felt like the blockbuster ending of a game when you're just killing off a bunch of enemies that you managed to do within 10 minutes of the game. It just felt rushed. Despite that, the Deep Darkness sequence worked extremely well and changed your expectations at the last moment. It was genuinely off-putting and verged on horror in a loose, more atmospheric way. As for the final scenes, I honestly don't hate the idea that this is all make-believe and that all fits into the kid adventure narrative, but it just doesn't help that it comes after a series of anticlimactic moments that it just reinforced. Even with it being slightly anticlimactic, the direction and cinematography is well done and it does lessen that blow. Was it all make-believe? I mean the ending. The ending is quite ambiguous to what happened and apparently this is on purpose, though I can't find a source for this claim. Either way, the small amount of fan fiction and fan lore that derives from Heart of Darkness insists that it isn't make-believe. Though that may be because it's more compelling to expand on it not being make-believe instead of saying, oh yeah, this is all fake, but here's my theory. For what it's worth, I do think this is all in Andy's head. We see a lot of inspirations for the various characters and locations in the real world, and this explains the weird way Andy transitions between the worlds and the believability of his inventions. However, there are a few questions that this theory doesn't answer. If it was all a dream, then why did Whiskey vanish and why did the dog seem to share a memory of these weird places? All of this is unexplained, but hardly important. Instead of saying it's all make-believe, you could actually go further into that theory and go quite dark with it. You can say that this is Andy battling through his fears and the innate darkness caused from ritualistic abuse from a terrible and horrific teacher. This game does predate Silent Hill by a year and it is not beyond the reach of plausibility that there was a slightly darker tinge to this story beneath the surface. As I say, the story isn't important and whatever theory you subscribe to, I don't think it changes all that much. Before we get to the conclusion, there are a few extra goodies in store for us. Firstly, there's this little extra scene involving the Amigos being the Amigos, being fun, silly, and if you enjoyed them in the game, you'll enjoy them more here. If not, forget about it. The most interesting one, though, is this old red and blue 3D version of Andy's dramatic last few minutes in the Heart of Darkness. This is weird. Even for a game that is this weird, this is weird. I can't remember red, blue 3D really being a thing in the late 90s. It had been a thing a bit earlier, before I was born, before Heart of Darkness was born, and it does harken back to that 80s video culture. However, it really does miss the mark, and like most Red Blue 3D, it doesn't work that well. I have included it because it is definitely worth watching. But now it's time to get back to them questions and criticisms that were levied against Heart of Darkness as we tidy up this retrospective. So the first one, is Heart of Darkness style over substance? Arguably yes, Heart of Darkness can be a bit stiff in its mechanics and while some of its puzzles are great in all of themselves, there is a bit of repetitivity to these core mechanics. The main strength of the game comes from how it displays these hurdles, how each tricky solution often has you running through beautiful scenery and narrowly escaping the shadows that are right behind you. But saying it's style over substance is a tad unkind to how holistic the experience is. Gameplay is so interwoven into the presentation that they become hard to separate. And now for the big question that looms like a shadow over Heart of Darkness. Did Heart of Darkness release too late? Well, yes, financially anyway. It launched in an era when full 3D was being truly realized and everything else was old school and not as popular. That is not to say there wasn't a market for older, harder, more classic style platformers, but that market tended to favor a purely mechanical experience. Heart of Darkness didn't fit into either bubble well. The fact that Heart of Darkness didn't also sell that many copies makes the game less culturally relevant and this is probably the biggest wound to Heart of Darkness. So what was gained from releasing it later? The reason that Heart of Darkness was delayed was said to be the desire to make it as perfect as possible and to make sure that the game was a coherent thing to play. And on the whole, the game is definitely coherent to play and while a bit of difficulty is expected, nothing is asked of the player that they can't reasonably work out. If this extra time was devoted to making Heart of Darkness as polished as it is, then maybe it is worth it, but it's hard to tell where that time was spent and whether or not it would have been coherent to play otherwise. 
And that explanation would be easy to follow if it wasn't for all the extras, from the interactive menus, scene transitions, animated credits, and that bloody alternative red and blue 3D cutscene. You could always argue that time could have been effectively spent elsewhere. But again, that misunderstands what makes Heart of Darkness what it is. Not all games serve the same purpose, nor do they have the same goals. Heart of Darkness's goal was to create an experience that fully enveloped the player and took them on an overly dramatic ride. It may have made the game less impactful by releasing later than needed. It may have even made the game less interesting to play by focusing on cohesive and holistic storytelling over mechanical complexity. But what Heart of Darkness has is a strong vision that everything in the game pulls towards so succinctly that you can't help but admire, and this is what makes Heart of Darkness a cult classic. You're a big help, you know that? Thank you for watching this extra long retrospective. If you have any comments, please leave them below, and any questions also leave them below, because I'm thinking about doing a Q&A about Heart of Darkness if there is any demand for it. And if you did think this was a worthwhile project, then please like it and please give me any recommendations for further retrospectives. I've been Robert Gammon Ross and this has been Heart of Darkness. Thank you very much. <laughs>